Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to an episode of the Businessology Show. This is our first show of 2023 after we've all gone through some funky years. And we're going to try to dive into some things at the start of this year with a great guest that can teach us a lot about economics. And so we're having Adam Davidson. He is the author of The Passion Economy, contributing writer to The New York Times, covering business, technology, economics, co-founded the NPR podcast, Planet Money. You may have heard of that. Uh, that was the brainchild uh, of Adam and also served internationally as economics correspondent for many years. So has tons of experience in the field, writing, teaching, writing books, and also served in the film industry. I'm going to say he served as a technical consultant to Adam McKay, who's the co as co-writer and director of the Academy Award winning film, The Big Short. And my friend, Adam Davidson. Adam, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you and see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you. Um, I guess we last saw each other in Texas last year. Yeah. Um, and you didn't say, like, importantly, <laughs> the world's leading writer about Jason Blummer. Well, that's... So I, wrote, I first wrote about you in the New York Times in, I want to say, 2015, something like yeah, that. And, yeah. then, and then wrote a big chapter about you so people who want to know that all the whole story of jason blummer is in my book the passion economy which really was inspired by conversations we have had over the years that's that's so cool so yeah you covered us in chapter four and then chapter five you covered the work we did with a client and chapter five was about one of our clients yeah, exactly. And I'd say the things I learned from you and Julie really influenced the whole book. So you're in every chapter, even wow. if I am just stealing your ideas. Obviously, this is a public venue, so I'm being very polite and complimentary. <laughs> Usually, I like to make fun of you, but well, um, well, yeah, I we can get into I, that too. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, let's let's get into it because here's I sent you an email and you did you did kind of um, I don't know if you made fun of me, but you're like. Yeah, bro, you've got it all wrong uh, is basically was your response. So what what I did is I'm always trying to learn. I love economics. I don't know much about it. I want to learn about it because we teach a lot of entrepreneurs. So I asked you, uh, I shot you an email and said, hey, I need a right and a left leaning view of economics. What publications should I get? And I assumed it was Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Uh, and I thought, hey, man, that's going to give me what I need to know to kind of stay uh, on the on the know about economics and uh, you completely even disagreed with my whole premise of getting a left and right leaning economics publication. So, and then you begin to school me. <laughs> so why, why, why is that just even a wrong premise for me to look at when it comes to learning about economics? <clears throat> yeah. So I think there's a lot of frames we can put on how we talk about economics and we can get into it like when it's yeah. appropriate to talk about a left and a right. And and there are cases where there's left and right. I, I also think there's like <clears throat> economists versus non-economists. So mm. if, if you think of economics as a field, like people who's, you know, professors whose job it is to be economists right. or the people who write the books and journal articles and do the research that is economics, there's a huge area where really left and right is is not helpful. We can get into mm. where it is helpful, but mm -hmm. um, but it really is about studying data. So then the political system, there's huge incentives for politicians to wildly exacerbate the differences between <clears throat> them. So just as an example, I have a memory when Obama was running against Mitt Romney, there's a period of time where the argument was over corporate <clears throat> tax. What should the corporate <clears throat> tax rate be? And if you heard the Republicans, Obama was a wild-eyed communist who wanted to destroy private <clears throat> enterprise. If you heard the Democrats, Mitt Romney was a vicious corporate raider who wanted rich people to get all the money. Obama's proposal was 25% corporate tax rate. Mitt Romney's proposal was 22%. We're talking about really narrow differences. Yeah. By the way, the vast majority of economists who study tax 
believe the optimum corporate tax rate is zero percent, and I can get into that. But effectively, it is a bad thing in an economy <clears throat> to tax corporations. It's a very inefficient and efficient is a big word mm -hmm. in economics. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was just a great example where economists are having one conversation where there really is no obvious difference between a lot of left wing and right wing economists. There's pretty narrow. The mm. politicians were having a totally different conversation where they were pretty close. Like, mm. yeah, you can imagine if I want 22 and you want 25, there's sort of an obvious middle ground somewhere between right. 23 and 24 where <laughs> um, neither one of us is losing too much. Yeah. Um, but the politicians themselves, in many cases, the media, there's a huge incentive to make it seem as if this is communism versus freedom, when really it's just minor nuances of policy. And okay. I'd say that is what much of our debate happens. Um, you know, I did a deep dive into President Trump's revision of NAFTA, for example, mm. and he wanted the world to think he threw NAFTA out and started something new. It's really minor. It'd be hard to really communicate how different um, his trade deal is from NAFTA. It wasn't, it was pretty minor stuff. So mm. what I'm saying is there's like how economists think and then there's how politicians and some people in the media and others exacerbate those differences. Okay. Yeah. And then we can get into left and right and when okay. that even makes sense. But yeah. I'd say day to day, like most of the articles are, or most of the topics that come up, there's not really a fundamental economic difference. Okay. I, I do want to get into that. And so, because I, I eventually want to end up with how do we, how do we use economic thought for entrepreneurs, which is our listeners on the show, to actually make decisions? And one thing entrepreneurs probably don't focus on as much is looking at a market and trying to read it because it's ex obviously extremely complicated. So I want to get into macro and micro. But before I do, I, I did um, want to dive into other lenses that if you get a little bit nerdier in economics, um, like you can get into F.A. Hayek. Uh, the founder of Austrian economics, who I tried to read his his book, The Road to Serfdom. I, I could not get through it. Um, um, and then how I thought, even from my lens, how, you know, he disagrees with Maynard Keynes, uh, you know, from Cambridge, uh, which which I've always seen those two is more of an opposed view, um, you know, where. Hayek is more of this capitalist guy, the individual, right, the, which is where we get microeconomics, the individual's decisions. And then the macro, uh, more of a defense si or um, a demand side, you know, creation of jobs through the government. Um, and, I, and I think some of those lenses are even wrong. And I don't know that people are reading our listeners are reading Hayek or Keynes and probably don't need to. <laughs> but those also have lenses to them. So, but can you, can you briefly give us some economic thought about, you know, those things? I don't know if the Chicago school is even good to put in there um, to help us understand the real economists are taught and trained by a lot of these people, right. Um, that form yeah. our thoughts. So, can, so I got that wrong too, in our emails. I'm like Hayek and Keynes <laughs> disagree. And you've like, Dude, you're wrong again. <laughs> I mean, a bit of it is, I mean, Hayek and Keynes, they're really important. We'll get into them in a second. They're fascinating yeah. individuals and their yeah. ideas are fascinating. But a little bit, it's kind of like, you know, should we build this bridge mm. up from, you know, from the side of the river to that side of the river? Yeah. And you could ask an engineer and they could talk to you about, you know, what size a bridge and what... <clears throat> You know, Safety, how, to, how yeah. to structure it and yeah. what what's you know is it built on gravel or rock or sand or and what you need to do you could talk to a city planner and they could talk about mm -hmm. the vision of the city you could mm -hmm. talk to a poet who would talk about yeah. <laughs> the, you know or you could talk to like a philosopher about what is the mm. meaning of life you know yeah and i i would say a lot Economics is a huge discipline. Very big. There's a lot of <clears throat> topics within it, and there's a lot of schools within it. And they're 
I would say they really are as different as like engineering and physics and history and mm-hmm. poetry. They really are. And yeah. we can see how far we want to get into that. So it's, it's not like, oh, there's this group of people who do this group of things. There's this group of people who do this group of things. And they're all one-to-one comparisons. Yeah. So, but let's get into it a little. I mean, I think the fundamental figure really is Adam Smith. And you really want to mm-hmm. yeah. engage Adam Smith. Now, I find The Wealth of Nations readable. I mean, it's, you know, it was written in 1776, yeah. rather famously. And yeah. it's, you know, it's written in an ornate style. But for that era, it's readable. <clears throat> There's certainly lots and lots of books about it. And his fundamental insights are still the fundamental insights that yeah. I'd say basically everyone agrees with, like Hayek agrees with. Yeah. Um, Keynes agrees with even Friedman, someone argued yeah. Karl Marx agrees yeah. with, you okay, know, like yeah. everyone, mm-hmm. like it really is above left and right. It's like, um, it's the foundation so, of economics as a science to study. It didn't used to be recognized. And, and I guess it came out of philosophy. The, yeah. The, I mean, uh, right. So, yeah. The, the, the specific moment that's happening in the, 1700s in Scotland, where Smith is mm. from, okay, is you know you had in Scotland up until up through the 1600s, you had what had existed in most of the world for since the dawn of agriculture, really, you know, <clears throat> 10,000 years ago. Yeah. You had systems where there was a tiny, powerful elite, mm. and you had most people are farmers, most people are illiterate peasants. Mm-hmm. And there's different systems of, you know, making sure that 98% of people or whatever are working all day, every day producing. Yeah. And there's a tiny elite. They could be called kings or emperors or whatever. Priests as well. I mean, you know, I'm talking yeah. ancient world. Yeah, yeah. And and there's not really a th- theory of economics. There's, you know, or to the extent some theories develop. They're, they're, we now look at them as pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, Smith called them mercantilism, which is basically <clears throat> the idea that if England is going to get rich, that means France has to get poor. And if France is going to re- get rich, it means England's going to have to be poor. Um, right. They call it beggar thy neighbor, which mm. is basically this idea that there's a zero sum <clears throat> game. Right. Winners and losers anyone, only. Winners and losers only. <clears throat> And sort of a fixed pie that, that there's only mm-hmm. so much money to go around or so much value. And, Which they've debunked and, that now, right? Well, you can look. I mean, our life is pretty different. You know, right. if you look at – I'm working on a project right now about – that happened to take place in 4,000 years ago. There's a bunch of economic texts from 4,000 years ago written on cool. clay tablets, cuneiform wow. tablets. and. It's really hard because we live in an age where, you know, every week there's massive improvement. But mm. if you look at, let's say, the 4,000 years before Adam Smith, <clears throat> life gets better for periods of time, often after mass die-offs. So you see, like, lots of people dying, bad crops or black mm. death or whatever. Then there's not as many people. People are able to grow more crops. They thrive and thrive. Then... There's another mass die off. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that like it's the natural order of things that life is always better 10 years, 20 years down the road just wasn't Mm. true for like 4000 years. Mm. You could easily find ancient Mesopotamian peasants who had way better lives than like 15th century French peasants, say. Mm. Um, And it was a little bit random if your life was better or worse than your grandfather's life, say. Um, and, mm-hmm. and a whole bunch of things start happening in the late 1600s. You know, there's um, really the spread of Protestantism that happened earlier. There's mm-hmm. the collapse of the full absolute power of the monarchy in England. Mm-hmm. There's also specifically in Scotland a collapse of the layered system where you have these like unbelievably powerful lords and all the people are just servants working for them. Yeah. And I, I, this might be way too much detail, but um, <laughs> I find that period fascinating. I mean, really reading about 18th century Scotland, you are like, Oh, this is where everything I believe 
came okay, from. Okay, so but uh, you're saying it, Adam it, Smith brought – he was coming out – well, not probably out he of He was the, coming in this crazy moment, this okay. crazy moment where for millennia – there was sort of unquestioned authorities, religious authorities and um, government authorities. And there was sort of an unquestioned idea that if I want to get rich, I got to take the money from you or from the peasants or from someone okay. else. Yeah. And Adam Smith, really, his kind of mentor and best friend was this guy, David Hume, who's also an important part of the story. We don't have to go too far, but David Hume's a mm -hmm. fascinating nice. character. There they're really moral theologians at base. And that really, weirdly enough, capitalism and economics comes out of moral theology, but it's a specific moment where wow. moral theology had been just whatever the Pope says or whatever the Catholic Church says. Mm -hmm. Then in, you know, then it was like, oh, the Church of England and the Church of Scotland and the bishops. And so an individ there was no like objective morality. It was just what oh, they said. I don't what they said and the average right. person wasn't even supposed to read the Bible or come to their own conclusions or anything. Right. They were just yeah. supposed to. And so this is a period where there's debates about whether they were atheists or what their mm. religious views were, but basically we're not going to just take the Bishop's word for it. We want uh -huh. a morality that comes out of logic that comes uh -huh. out of philosophy that comes out of like, okay. Like, but they wanted it to be robust. <clears throat> they wanted a morality that would really help people work together to make the world better, to make that opportunity for shared prosperity, knowing that people are awful. And <laughs> so um, Adam Smith wrote two books. The first was The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where mm. he actually makes this argument that we fundamentally want to be good, but we can't like we're just awful and so so that was the problem we don't okay. have objective truth okay we don't have just a, a clear authority so how do we think our way and we're really greedy and selfish and we don't really care about each other <laughs> i'm overstating it smith was more generous to us but but so how can that's we the have basis. a morality that's the that's my so how can we create a system <clears throat> where we can sort of, instead of trying to stop us from being guilt, greedy, harness our greed to achieve <clears throat> public benefit, to make everyone better off. And there you get to all these ideas that become economics um, about, that, you know, mm. he's, he starts with price. He starts with um, <clears throat> competition becomes the core. And essentially... The core idea of economics, which in a sense is going to be the thing everyone's going to fight over, including to today, is um, how does that competition work? So mm -hmm. if you imagine... Or should be allowed to work also, right? Or should be allowed to work, yes. Yeah. And so... So... The, the world Adam Smith described, the, wor the ideal world, is if you imagine kind of like a medieval village, yeah. everyone in the village has equal access to any business. I could become a baker, you could become a baker. There's not, you know, this is coming out of the guild system where you, yeah. you know, where being a baker was carefully controlled. Yeah. Um, and everybody, so everybody's free to produce goods and anyone's free to purchase what they want. I could buy bread from you. I could buy bread from someone else. I could mm. buy bread from you today and buy it from someone else tomorrow. And there's perfect information or there's a lot of information. So, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So in that world, each person if I want to get rich, how do I get rich? In the old system, I'm if I'm a lord, I just keep being a lord and I use yeah. my my the wealth I got from my great 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 grandfather to crush my enemies. And nobody or can I take try it and away. Crush a lord, and no one can right. take it away. 
And I don't, I'm not really thinking, oh, I have $10 million or whatever. Um, I want $100 million. I'm just like, $10 million is great. I'm just going to keep it at $10 million. <laughs> And then if I'm somehow, I mean, you know, you find these people who are kind of self-made peasants who rise up, but the, they know how am I going to get powerful? I'm going to have to kill that lord. That's how I'm going to mm. get powerful. And then I'm going to mm. crush everybody <clears throat> instead of him. And Adam Smith is like, well, what if the system was... If I want to get rich, I actually have to create, I have to make something that other people voluntarily choose to buy. And mm, that's starting and, to and, sound like economics. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I, if I'm the baker and I've been a baker forever and my dad was a baker and I decide, you know, I can make some more money by throwing some sawdust into the flour, which was a real thing that happened. <laughs> If I'm the only baker and I have a license from the Lord to be the baker because I'm paying the Lord off mm. and you you don't like my bread, you're out of luck. But if you could just be like, wow, his bread sucks now. It used to be good. I'm <laughs> going to start making good bread. Then that's better for the consumer and it creates the right incentives for each of us to create a mm. better product and service yeah. at a better price. So. That's a simple model. Okay. But that essentially is the ideal, which we could call it an entrepreneurial ideal. It does sound like it. Yeah, for that sure. That undergirds all modern day economics. I mean, there are still, we can talk about socialists, Marxists, yeah. but that core idea is everyone basically everyone who is an economist believes in like yes, okay. that would be awesome okay and then the fights so one big fight is over why does that not happen like what who are the lords of today you know mm. who are the powerful people who are using power to crush competition who are those people okay and we can get into that those could be for some, those are unions, labor unions. For others, yeah. those are monopoly corporations or massive yeah. oligopolistic corporations like the gas industry yeah. or big four accounting or what is yeah. it, big three now. Or yeah. So <clears throat> because you and I can't, like in a medieval village, we actually could just become a baker. Like how hard is it? We buy some wheat, we mm. <laughs> grind it up. Maybe we suck yeah. at it. Maybe we're good at it. But... <laughs> But you and I can't like start a cable company today and immediately compete right. with the cable company. We all hate our cable company, right? right. Everyone hates their cable company, <laughs> um, but nobody's like- You can't oh, do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. That's and right. That was actually a good, a friend of mine, Alex Bloomberg said, you know something's a, mon a monopoly is a company that you just hate, but pay the money anyway. <laughs> and <laughs> and if you think right. about it, yeah. Whereas your business or my business, like you're earning your pay day by day. And if you do something tomorrow that pisses off all your customers, you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you really are facing the full gale force of voluntary entry and exit. Yeah. Any one of your customers can quit you and um, and you. So, and you could quit tomorrow also. You could just yeah. say, I'm done. Yeah. I don't like this anymore. I got a new idea. I'm going to start Blummer Cable. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so a big question is <clears throat> who's got their thumb on the scale and how does that work? Okay. So can I summarize? Yeah. Which I, I didn't, I didn't know all of that, but basically economics came out of people that believe we need theories to define how to control bad people as we're coming out of these gilded serfdom type situations. So we need to define the fact that we're bad. So how do we do this in a fair way since we know we're not good people? Although it's not control, <laughs> it's harness. That's one of the profound insights is that greed ah. can, can be an engine Oh, I see. For economic growth. And, then, and, that's, and that's the wealth of nations, which is I'm going to take it from you, but it's good because our nation becomes wealthier. No, 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 we, no, no. No, he's saying no, we're okay. done with that whole idea. Oh, merc we, mercantilism. 
so we're anti mercantilism. We no okay, longer. I'm so with you. Adam Smith was saying we're done with that idea. And I actually, see. Okay. The best way for England to get rich is for France to get rich too. I'm because with you. Then okay. We, we have more customers to sell to. They're making right, right. stuff we can buy. And that has really borne out, right? Like, the oh, world that's totally is entrepreneurship. Wildly richer. Yeah. And, and the world as a whole is wildly richer in, than it was 50 years ago and certainly than it was, you know, 250 years ago. Yeah. And so it's these are the big insights that are counterintuitive and people really <laughs> struggle with. Like, it's kind of amazing to me that we all grew up in this system that has some pretty explicit assumptions, but most of us didn't like get the guidebook to our society, <laughs> like the basic, I mean, it's right there. It's Adam Smith. Yeah. Um, but it's like we, so when I talk to more left-wing friends and they're like, well, corporations are greedy. They shouldn't be greedy. I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, maybe that's true. I don't know. You can have no. that belief, but the mm. system you live in, is one in which that's not the argument. The argument is not they shouldn't be greedy. It's what is the system in which their greed manifests? And okay. so if you look at Russia today or North yeah. Korea today <clears throat> and par many parts of the U.S. economy today, their greed is unhealthy because there isn't true competition. There isn't Mm. real voluntary entry and exit. Mm. Um, they're not really, they are protected politically. You know, I, I spent about a year in Iraq right after Saddam fell, and I got to know a lot about how Iraq worked. And the surest sign someone was going to be rich is how closely related they were to Saddam Hussein. Right. Not yeah. how... Um, the market were smart worked. they were or, or how yeah how good their yeah. products were or whatever and yeah. there's this one kind of car <clears throat> i think it was um like a super cheap volkswagen like one you would never see in america i forget mm. what the brand name was that was everywhere it was the most popular car in in iraq and when i asked i was like why does everyone drive that crappy car they're like because <laughs> saddam's wife got the contract to import them <laughs> and so okay. that's the car like um you're not gonna be like huh i kind of i sort of like the safety rating of the volvo but i really <laughs> like the sexy look of the it's just no saddam's wife wants this car right and she's going to charge you double what it's worth because she can and if you right. complain we'll kill you so um so that's where economies don't work that's where economies don't work. And there's no perfect economy. There never has been a perfect economy. So right. there's always this balance between. Well, let me put it this way. No, one, there has never been the perfect Smithian economy where every person can enter any business or leave any business where each consumer has all the choice they possibly want. Yeah. And the price sim signal is constantly adjusting to reflect mm. the collective interests of everybody. Yeah. And so how far it is or close it is from that idealized system is, is really where the debates come. It's not what okay. should the system be. It's, all right, we don't have everything perfect. Why don't we? And how do we? think about that okay and, and so, what i would argue is the vast sorry i keep cutting you off but just to finish the point yeah the vast majority of left and right debates is in america today and in europe and other modern economies is less ideological or intellectual and much more like are you tight with saddam's nephew or are you tight with mm. Saddam's wife? So like, if you mm. look at a lot of the choices, the actual economic choices made by Democrats or Republicans, <clears throat> we can get at some theoretical, like ideological arguments, but really it's, oh, this is our team. We want to break the rules to benefit our team. Mm. And the other guys are like, no, no, no. We want to break the rules to benefit our team. But neither one really, I think, gets to claim like, no, no, we're the ones who are true to Adam Smith and those other people are not. And so that's what I find frustrating. So, you know, you often, you know, the people more likely to say we're for free markets, we believe in Adam Smith are yeah. Republicans these days, although that was not always the case. Ah, uh, right. It used to be big business was very actively about 
crushing the market <laughs> to mm. their will. They still are in practice, mm. but in but there's been this theoretical revolution or this argument, this, in my mind, untrue BS argument mm. that one side is for markets and the other side is against markets. Right. You know, the president in modern history who has intervened in the most extreme ways in the economy is definitely Donald Trump. There's no, yeah. I don't think there should be a debate. And yeah. Republicans very quickly were very comfortable with him saying, I want to crush Jeff Bezos because I don't like what he's doing. Right. I want to help these industries because I like them. I want to hurt those industries. I mean, that that is, um, you know, very, it's not economic thinking. It's, <laughs> it's oh, he's the Lord. He gets to do what he wants. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so, and it's not like on economic issues, I'd say the Republicans and Democrats used to be fairly balanced and they actually basically believe the same thing. We can get into that history. But I think it's much more useful to think of an economic way of thinking versus a political way of thinking than to think, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm on the side of the people pretending to be for free markets okay. instead of the side pretending not to be for free markets. Okay. Because, you... because the Democrats are actually as much for free markets in many ways okay. as the Republicans are, but they have to pretend that they're not for their People. Okay, but so so basically, yeah. applying political thought to economic thought doesn't make sense because politicians have different a different lens that is not an economic lens, which is what, what the thing. But but sometimes, yeah, I mean, economics can explain that they they have things they value, so they are actors essentially in a marketplace. One of the things they value is money. They want contributions. Maybe they want a good lobbying job and after they retire from mm, yeah. Congress or whatever. They have their own they goals. They also want power. They have their own yeah. goals. And so they are rational in that they're doing exactly what Adam Smith said they do. They're doing whatever the system allows them to do yeah. to get more of the thing they want. And all of us, I mean, this would be Adam Smith's sort of argument. <clears throat> all of us will do that. And if the system is, if you want to get rich, you got to be Saddam Hussein, then we're either going to try and be Saddam Hussein or we're going to try and be one of his cronies. Right. Or so, so what Smith is saying is you, you can't really look at those individuals and say, oh, they're terrible. They're just human. And we what would do the same do thing is, in that situation, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK. Well, so, OK, so so that's a that's a history of where economics came from, which is really theoretical philosophy, starting to write down and document the philosophies of a world that should work in a different way. Uh, not the Saddam way, right? It should work in a different way. And so now I, I often use the word entrepreneurship as a, you know, that's a very market focused uh, word possibly. But entrepreneurs are not economists, but what they're dealing with is the macro and micro economic focuses ev in their everyday life. And so a lot of times we'll teach I think we're trying to teach economic concepts like competition, pricing. You know, those are those are things we talk a lot about. And then we talk a lot about counterintuitive type uh, economic theories, which is why don't you become a high value business and you start making a choice of a client to come in instead of clients choosing your your agency? Why don't you choose your client and why don't you actually double your price to prove your value position strongly and then fire everybody who doesn't like that. And that's just a simplification. But we're basically yeah. saying, let's leverage a little bit of what this market will allow. And, and lo and behold, counterintuitively, sometimes, or at least entrepreneurs feel it's counterintuitive to, to go fire people and double prices. They're like, that really feels scary. And we actually know economically it does work. But but now when we come into an economy that we don't understand, that is not behaving, I don't know if behaving is the right word. It's not going to do what we think, which is let's double the prices. Well, in a scared market, everybody goes, well, I'm really not going to choose you now. It's, they're like, well, F, that didn't work. <laughs> so yeah. what, what using economic so theory, what, what does an entrepreneur do now to navigate an economy that's kind of not, I don't know, doing what it's supposed to do when everybody's scared yeah so, i don't know so we we probably should talk about micro and macro okay those yeah are, define that those really are two wildly different also wildly different like you go to the 
you go to a conference of economists, it's probably either a microeconomist or a macro, and right. they don't even know each other. Like they never met. They didn't go to grad school together. <laughs> they don't read each other's papers. It's right. like a wildly different world. Okay. And yeah, and one way to think about micro is micro is generally stuff you can do. Individual so, focused, basically. Yeah, it could be individual firms or individual people, but mm -hmm. you can choose where you live. You could choose how much to pay for your house. You could yeah. choose to start a firm. You the could price of your services. To charge. You can choose that. The price that. of your services. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Macro is kind of like the weather. It's the price level, which is just the way economists talk about inflation. Like, yeah. So I can say, I'm going to charge $10,000, but then there's this force out there that suddenly made ten thousand dollars worth, you know, twenty percent less. Yeah, and I don't, I can't individually choose to make that force go away or not. Mm. Um, even more so, macro. Often we think about <clears throat> global macro. So, mm -hmm. um, if if my ten thousand dollars service is in part based on me <clears throat> hiring a bunch of people in hungary to do the back end work and so i'm like oh great i charge ten thousand i pay them two thousand but then suddenly the <laughs> hungarian florent is rises in value for reasons i can't control mm -hmm. and so to pay them the same amount i have to spend four thousand us dollars yeah i can't i don't have control over that that's macro so macro te macro tends to deal with overall GDP growth, so overall growth of the economy, or the price level, like how much does a dollar buy, basically. Um, these big things, it also tends to influence government spending, and we should get into mm -hmm. like how government spending, because nobody, it, in the simplistic way people describe Keynesians, and we'll get into that, <laughs> Everyone's a Keynesian, but in real out, nobody's doing what Keynes told them to do. Mm. What Keynes told them to do, if would be like a radical, it would probably be seen as a radical right wing idea, oh. this, which is basically <laughs> the government most of the time should not be spending a lot of money. But we can get into that. We can right. get into all of that. So for an individual, Like, how am I structuring my company? And you know this, I'm right now in the middle of literally relaunching a company, mm. I'm choosing what are my products? What am I gonna charge? Yeah. Who are my competitors? Who are my customers? I'm that, right in that. That's microeconomics right there. That's all microeconomics. <clears throat> and so a lot of the thinking I find most helpful from economics. So Adam Smith really engaging, what does supply and demand mean? Yeah. Like, cause, cause supply and demand is not the price should be a buck. Supply and demand is the market adjusts based on what the price is. And um, and so, you know, to an economist, there's something called a price curve, not a price. So it's not, oh, I have this new mm. chocolate bar. I think it's better than Snickers. Should I call it, charge $2 or $5? Mm. It could change. The price curve would show us that there are, you're going to sell different amounts at different levels. Mm. Like a hundred years after Adam Smith, there's something in economics that's called the marginal revolution, but it's this idea that pricing <clears throat> should be based on the marginal consumer and that, um, and, and instead of the price curve, economists start talking about the indifference curve. And the indifference curve is the price where a consumer is indifferent between the amount of money and the thing. So ah, okay. let's say I make a, a chocolate bar that's really, really good. Yeah. And maybe there's some number of people who would pay a thousand dollars for that. And they're like crazy chocolate fanatics. They love everything about me. And so I could sell five for a thousand dollars. Yeah. But then I'm like, I bet I could sell more. What if I sold them for five hundred dollars? And yeah. now I've got more people. Then yeah. I sell it for ten dollars and I got more people. <clears throat> What the marginal revolution would tell us is you want to keep lowering your price until somebody says, I don't know, two bucks, I, I could kind of take it or leave it, but yeah. sure, I'll take your chocolate bar. And if you charge $2 and one cent, they'd say, yeah, forget it. That's too much. Mm. And so that point of indifference really underlies 
so much of what became the 20th century industrial market, where you have so much commodification of products and services. You, you have, um, you know, ivory soap. Yeah. If you go on the American Dermatological Association website, there's one soap they say sucks. Never use this soap, and it's ivory soap. <laughs> ivory soap is a terrible soap. It, uh -huh. like, dries out your skin. It's nobody. It's awful. But it dominated the market because they, by selling it at that indifference price, they were able to sell so much of it yeah. that it allowed them to build bigger and bigger factories to amortize their costs across much larger sales so they could build the distribution networks and you know they really ivory soap really launches modern advertising and branding mm. <clears throat> so you have a case where that indifference pricing model leads to um a huge um market share for arguably the worst possible product. And then you you can kind of think about life in the 20th century. I mean, you and I are old enough that we remember, yeah. you know, yeah. half our lives were in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, we all had the same phone, like everyone had that same yeah. phone, the the Western electric, um, I used to know the number like 540 or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you know, if, if I live in New York City, in artist housing, and I come to Greenville in 1978, you and I probably were eating the same cereal. We were yeah. using the same toilet paper. We were, and it wasn't that great. The yeah. stuff wasn't that. Like it was fine, but it wasn't like amazing. Some products were really good. Like you could buy a blender in 1932 and it's still yeah. working in 1987, which yeah. is not the case anymore. But right. that's all about this indifference. Okay. Now, I wrote a book called The Passion Economy, which, based on a lot of what you teach for individual service providers. So if you want to be a billionaire, if you want to create a massive global scale corporation, economics would teach you, you want to be on that indifference curve. You okay. want to be on the like, I don't give a crap. Sure, I'll give you my dollar. And if you think of a lot of products in your life, it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll do that product, sure. But you and I have a different view, right? Like our view yeah. is we want to be in the passion business. So we'd rather make a thousand dollar chocolate for five people right. and make a business out of it than make millions the, of chocolate for a dollar. That's subpar. That's subpar. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But now, okay. So as we were wrapping up here, how, how does this apply to, which is which is probably the focus of our listenership, which is service-based entrepreneurship, which is is different, obviously, than a manufacturing organization. Service-based, we like to call these human organizations. They're, it is very relational. So scaling these businesses is based upon relationships with your team and leading them, relationships with clients, choosing to end a relationship, enter into a new relationship when you convince them to pay you double what they're paying the last agency or something like that. Service-based entrepreneurship is so relational. I think we get embedded down in the people we're always talking to every single day. When we're still a business, there are market forces defining what we can and can't do. And so, for example, with agencies, right? So a marketing agency sometimes – um, one of my friends, Greg Crabtree, said marketing is like the canary in the coal mine, right? So that is that is a cost people are going to cut, right, when an economy is beginning to go down. That is when people start to feel some level of fear, like I don't know what's coming and I'm sensing something. Marketing is a thing they may cut, kind of giving us some insights into what's coming in an economy. Um, that's not formal, but just something you can think about. So Marketing agencies are a business, and they are a they're a force in the market, right? They're needed, and there's tons of choices, right? Competition is a huge part. Competition and price is a huge part of the U.S. Uh, or any kind of Western economic market, I guess. Um, how, how do as we're wrapping up? How do service based entrepreneurs leverage 
economics. Maybe they shouldn't leverage macro, which is more policy driven, and it's more yeah, micro. I mean, macro does macro does <clears throat> cover what economists call the business cycle, which is basically booms and busts, recessions right. and growth. And periods. that's not so stuff we should good. study as an entrepreneur, maybe. I mean, I think you probably would want to get <clears throat> a range of just understand it then. It, of understanding and sort of where the predictions are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I personally would caution against adhering too firmly to an ideological um, position for business cycles because you do have, you know, there's a lot of, you know, whenever you see this person caught called the Great Recession or this person called the financial crisis or this person called the yeah. last big one. Yeah. When you actually look at how people make predictions. Generally, people make the same prediction every single day, and then, you know, two times in their lifetime it comes true, and then they mm -hmm. do a lot of marketing around that. So <laughs> the people who called the financial crisis like 2007, 2008, 2009 were calling for a financial crisis for years and years and years. They're still calling for a financial crisis. They're always calling for a financial okay. crisis. Um, there's other people who are always saying it's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Oh. Um, and they're sometimes right. But, you know, I do meet people who are like, oh, I'm a full Austrian school. That explains everything. Or I, I believe in the gold standard. Or I, and it's yeah. fine to have those beliefs. I'm just saying as a business person, I think you want to have a sense of the range of predictions. And okay. when you see kind of everyone moving towards, you know, earlier this year, kind, you know, eight years ago, there was a lot of <laughs> ideological libertarians who were saying we're about to have mac massive inflation. <clears throat> And they were just wrong for eight years. I knew mm. this guy, I'd see him about once every six months. And every six months he'd say, next time we see each other, there's gonna be massive inflation. And I was like, at some point, you gotta realize you're wrong. Like you don't get to say the same thing every day. And like, oh, I think Jason Blummer is gonna trip today. And then I just keep saying that every day. And five years from now you trip. I'm like, see, I'm a genius, I always knew. Um, at the same time, you know, there's, there's, people who are predicting the death of capitalism or, you know, yeah. left wing people with their ideological blinders. So if, if you have an ideology and you want to believe in that ideology, go for it. I have no problem you're, with that. But, but you're, you're saying as a mac business person, you, you need to be careful. You're saying macroeconomics, you need to be careful attaching your ideology to that to belief, your business. to your yeah, business. Like, you, you, yeah, it's I mean, not like your of, ideology you know, that's going to run your business. You need to leverage proper market forces. You need to know microeconomics and what humans are purchasing now yeah. and, and what they're probably not going to purchase. A range of predictions. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> my dad had prostate cancer. He's fine. But mm. he had this doctor who really believed in one theory mm. about treating yeah. it, which was actually a really exciting idea a few years ago that they were going to use basically vaccines to treat cancer. Hmm. And it was so exciting and I got super into it. It turns out it didn't work or it hasn't hmm. worked yet. Hmm. So we kept our mind open. We talked to a lot of different doctors. Yeah. We didn't marry the vaccine theory as the only way we're going to treat my dad. And I would say that's a similar thing for your business. You should have a general sense, hmm. like check in with it once a month. What are people saying about where the economy's headed? Mm -hmm. And you should get nervous when there's kind of beginning to be a broad consensus like oh yeah i think we are headed towards a recession even then it's <laughs> often wrong and it's often like so vague it's like sometime in the next yeah. three years we're going to have between right negative two and positive two percent growth and it's like thanks a lot pal that, that's useless <laughs> you know i can predict that sometime in the next 50 years you're going to die right but that's not very helpful for right. day to day that's life. right so um so anyway, so I find when people are like, oh, no, I, I just I'm obsessed with the gold standard. Fine, okay. be obsessed with the gold standard. But yeah. we're not I can just promise you we're not going on the gold standard anytime soon. And don't run your business based on. OK, that makes I think sense. we should be on the gold so, standard. So, so, so macroeconomics. So macro is more like how do you vote and how do you and it's like mm. reading the weather forecast. OK, how do you like see what's going on? And, and you know, maybe it's how do you be a blowhard at family dinners and stuff about what you think these idiots in Washington should be doing. Right. But it's not, <laughs> I, it shouldn't be a major driver of your day-to-day -day business. Okay, so when you're On driving- your day-to-day -day business, sorry, go ahead. Well, when you're driving your family crazy at Thanksgiving, you know, and you're complaining about the economy, you're complaining about your macroeconomic ideology. And you're saying, please don't apply that to your business as an entrepreneur. 
that's foolish um, because um, you you can use that to vote microeconomics you can have also choices like for example a lot of the people we teach or coach we would say position strongly for high value let your price be double your competition and build that kind of business but but a lot of people go no i want to be commodity high volume you know you talk about all this in the passion economy you, yeah you yeah. know you talk you talk about why don't you be double the price in high value which is things we've talked a lot but some and you talk a lot about the industries who were commoditized pencil makers brush makers and how they changed their lives using i guess micro economic theory and economics a hundred percent okay yeah. so so i would say the number one idea the number one idea I think maybe I'll say in an hour, I'll call you and be like, no, no, the number one I do is a different <laughs> idea. But for now, let's say this. Okay, number one this idea, is it, y'all. Yeah, is that, and I feel like I've learned this from you and from people you hook me up with. Price is not a thing. <laughs> price is the result of a process mm. and it both <clears throat> is a response to and a shaper of relationships. And that is true if you are selling cheap pencils and staples mm. or soap or a huge you're selling <clears throat> services to three clients a year for a million dollars each or whatever yep. price price is a result and a driver it's a complicated pro it's it's but it's all about price it all goes through price and price is where you want to be both thoughtful and playful <clears throat> the, the second you're like taking the market price, yeah. there's actually a phrase in economics, price takers. Price takers. It's often used to refer to agriculture. Right. If I grow corn. True commodity. my corn like, yeah, <clears throat> I could tend my corn like you can't believe. I could, you know, individually paint brush on exactly the right moisture, but I'm going to get matter. the market price. Right. Doesn't you're a price matter. taker. And we want to yeah. become price and makers. We want to become price makers. Yeah. And... Now, this is stuff Adam Smith, I mean, there's a, this, we don't have to get into this, but for like a long time, like 150 years or something, economists really thought value was about goods. Like, man, like yeah. I take corn and I turn it into flour and I take flour and I turn it into bread. Mm. And services were really seen as a tax. Like, mm. yeah, we have to have these middlemen <clears throat> who are running around like taking money, but they're not adding value. Yeah. But. We now have, people always say a service-based economy. That doesn't mean waiting, waiting tables or cutting hair. That right. means anything that isn't manufacturing. Yeah. You and I are service providers, doctors are service right. providers, yeah. lawyers are service providers, yeah. um, <clears throat> internet companies, you know, Google's a service provider. Mm -hmm. They also do some manufacturing, but they're fundamentally a service provider. Mm -hmm. So um, services, so, so, understanding that services are a bit more unmoored from the real world so they're you know that you and i both disagree with cost plus pricing right where it's it costs me a buck and a quarter so i'm going to charge you a buck 30. right or 10 percent more than but, what it costs me that or 10 is 10 percent more than it costs we believe me. that's yeah, wrong right. Costing is wrong. Right. Pricing is right. It's kind of how we view that. Yeah. Right. And we we'll probably recommend <clears throat> to a um manufacturer not to do cost plus, but to service providers, as we've discussed a lot, there is no cost plus. <laughs> like it, it's all your, like if, if time is your cost, <clears throat> you're, that's not an objective thing. Like, oh, I just bought a bushel of corn that the market price at $38, yeah. your time is constructed the very nature of it its value is constructed in the moment that you say what it costs yeah and so if i'm telling you every hour of my day is worth 57 dollars, i have now shoveled myself like stuffed myself into a concept of time that is restrictive it, it puts a ceiling on my earnings oh. Um, I'm thinking, oh, it puts a floor on my earnings, maybe like that's what feels exciting, but it also puts a ceiling. Yeah. So when you shift from cost plus or time value to value based pricing, where the value is what the consumer 
is willing to wants, pay. Right. Is willing to pay. Now, I would say it's consistent with Adam Smith, for example. Mm. But I think if you told him this, he'd be like, "What are you? I don't know what you're talking about. That doesn't make any sense." <laughs> okay. I think. I mean, he was a smart guy. He'd probably get it. But um, <laughs> well, and so, so okay. I guess what I'm getting at is price. I think a lot of people think of price as they they are in a price taking mentality. They get a job and, and, and the question is not, what do I add? What value can I add to a corporation? Which corporation will most recognize my value? Right. It's, oh, I'm an accountant. I'm going to go there. I looked on Glassdoor and they pay Here's, between 67 and $73 an hour. Right. I'm going to try and get 73, but I'll probably be fine with 70. Mm -hmm. That's a price taking mentality. Yeah. Similarly, I'm an agency, a complete branding redesign generally goes for 50 grand. So Jason tells me I should be on the high end. Okay, I'm going to be 45 grand. <clears throat> That's taking. This is not to say you should never use references right. in setting your pricing, but it's understanding that accepting a price is also accepting all the ideas around that price, the structure around that price. It's accepting a whole concept of what is the value you're creating? What is the product you're making? And the fun thing about services is we can literally second by second and reinvent. Like if I you're a bakery, it. at some point you got to buy an oven, you got to buy, you got to commit. Like, you, you can't just, you got to commit. You can't just one morning be like, we bake bread, and the next morning be like, we bake pizzas. You know, like you need different <laughs> yeah. There's capital costs. Yeah. With services, I could literally in the middle of a conversation be like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, and this is something I'm dealing with right now. Yeah. Do I want to charge. <laughs> 10 people, five grand a month to be their advisor? Do mm. I want to charge three people a package for a hundred grand or 200 grand a year mm. to fulfill some specific task? Do yeah. I want to do a mix of that? And I can literally have those thoughts in my head. And while I'm talking to you, if I know to be playful with price and I know that <laughs> price, it's not infinitely playful. I can't decide tomorrow. I'm going to charge a billion dollars right? and I'm going to work for one second, you know, like I, it, but if I know to be playful, and if I know that price is not a thing that exists in the world that I have to be true to, it's rather probably the thing, it is the value I'm creating at the end of the day, yeah. having the conversation, and this is all the stuff I learned from you, having the very conversation about value is in a sense, the product you're selling. And so um, I love it. To me, that's a deep, profound, exciting idea. And if you want to know, I don't know, Adam and Jason, I don't know, they seem pretty high on this. What did Adam Smith do? He changed how we thought about prices and that made the modern world. That is why we have airplanes and cell phones and AI. And that's why we live till we're 80 and not until we're 35. Right. Um, that's why there's heading towards 9 billion people on earth instead of less than a billion, because he changed how we think about prices because before him, prices were determined by a by lord a system yeah by a lord or by a guild or by a and the guild reported to the lord and kicked up a share and then he said no no we're gonna pr we're gonna change how we think about prices and he transformed the world yeah you know completely and, transformed the world and here we are uh as and we'll have we'll have to wrap up here but here here we are <laughs> trying to understand this right in the in the the daily lives we we run uh, as we're entrepreneurs, you know, making choices. And and I, I love the service-based mindset because it's what you said. It is such a creative, not not the work we do even, uh, that is creative. I'm talking about the prices and services. We get to make them up every day if we want, or we get to say it and it you can speak it into being and say do you want this and they go i didn't know you sold that and you're like yeah it's uh fifteen thousand dollars we do that yeah and it, you just we do that even though just, i literally just made it up i yeah. just made it up and we've done that so many <laughs> yeah. times um now you oh my god i've done that a million and, yeah and i'm in the so middle of it awesome. and it's really fun and what and i mean that would mean if i could go to any creative professional and be like if I can, <clears throat> you know, make one kind of matrix like switch in their brain, yeah. it would be pricing should be 
as creative as the creative work you do, or or at least in I that, love it. it should feel like that. It should feel like just like someone's talking about their web needs, and you're like, oh my god, I got this vision for yeah. It's not even just a website. I think there's a whole. We could have a print package with lush whatever. Yeah, you're doing all this creative thinking, and then you're like, well, how much do I charge you? Well, everyone else charges this, so yeah. I'll charge. That's fine. That yeah. No, it's like, wait, what is this relationship? I'm not just right. His web designer. I'm his advisor. I'm helping him shape, helping him think about these very questions. Yeah. I'm helping him think about what is he offering. That's worth. All right, that is worth a million dollars to him. I'm going to charge him eighty thousand right. instead of thirty five thousand. Right. And maybe you don't. You know, maybe you lose. I don't know. But but that, yes, the but playfulness of pricing. Yeah, and, and the profundity of pricing. Our our whole society is held together by prices. I love it, and in good and bad ways. When when there's massive intervention in pricing, when there's massive subsidy or there's price fixing yeah. or whatever, mm. that's where you see breakage, deep deep breakage. Right, and where prices can reflect true supply and demand, true. So, and sorry, just to wrap up, I know you got to wrap yeah. up. Can I go 10 seconds yeah, longer? Yeah, 10 seconds, yeah. That's why, <laughs> all right, that's why services are so interesting because there is no objective supply and demand. You are making up the supply and demand. That's you are, that right. is what you are doing. You're saying, I'm going to supply something different because I see you demand something different. Right. So that requires a new price because it's a new thing. It's a new supply and demand I love curve. It. That's the result of the process of our conversation. Yeah. And you, and that's the power we have as, service-based, you know, creative service-based providers is to make those things, really create our own mini economies across the table between me, the provider, and my client sitting there trying to make a decision. It's like, let's kind of blow the, the economy up a little bit. Let's create our own economy. Do you want this? How bad do you want it? Because <laughs> I'm going to really yeah. provide great value to you. Um so, okay, this is good stuff. I could nerd out. I hope everybody was okay with us nerding out about uh, the yeah, background. I, know, of, I never know. It's well, it's good. It's good stuff. Now, what are you really quick? I know we have to wrap up, but you're you're always starting something new. <laughs> what you're doing? What are you doing real quick after the book, Passion Economy? You wrote that uh, what a couple years ago. When, yeah, it came out. Yeah, three years ago. Um, oh, so wow. I'm working on a. <laughs> I mean, I'm still doing lots of writing, mm. but I'm basically writing that book and, and my other work. I was like, I think I'm really good at um, helping business people tell their story. Yeah. Like I've told you many times, I feel I'm much better at telling the Jason Blummer story than yeah. Jason Blummer is. Yeah, you and, are. Yeah. And <laughs> that's true. And, um, and I think reading the <clears throat> chapter about you in my book is a real sign of that. that, mm -hmm. that I think and so. I did a lot of the techniques that I think are powerful where yeah. we really go deep on your failings early in your career yeah, for and sure. how those led to your later successes. Yeah. A lot of business people struggle with that kind of narrative. Yeah. So I'm trying to do that work for others. My thing is I don't want them to see it as, oh, you're a copywriter or, you know, because uh. that I want them to see it as like, you are mission critical. If we if yeah. we can tell our story powerfully and well, we get more investment. We get yeah. We can recruit higher quality candidates for less money. We can get better customers. We can align our teams. But I am struggling to articulate it right at the moment yeah. in a way where because I I can have I've had a bunch of conversations. I have had a bunch of clients. I mean, I've made a few hundred grand on yeah. this. But um, <clears throat> but I'm really not. I haven't productized it enough yet. I haven't. I don't yet have like. I know what my spiel is. I know how to say yeah. it. I have a real insight into how to price it right. So yeah. that's what I'm working on right uh, okay. now. Okay, and you're it's called masterful storytelling right now. Although I'm learning that word storytelling is the wrong signal, uh, so I'm going to change the name okay. of the company. I haven't decided. So you, yet. you're in the midst of microeconomics, sorting it into the economy that an economy can respond and understand what exactly. you're saying. And what I've learned, <clears throat> which is a big change in my life, this is the most fun. I love this. Now, my goal, and I think I'll succeed it. I, I bet a year from now, I'm making good money and it's pretty stable. Yeah. And I'm going to get bored out of my mind. I'm going to want to <laughs> blow things up and figure out a whole new way to do it. Because yeah. this, I'm now like, I'm the opposite. Like, I'm yeah. more enjoy coming up, productizing, yeah. pricing figuring out how to package services. <clears throat> I like my work. I enjoy it. I like working with a business and figuring out how to communicate their story. And, yeah. But I like I like this stuff more now. And that's new for me. That's not something I know you've been there for a while now, yeah. but that 
that is really exciting. It's like fun. Nice. Okay. Well, Adam, this is awesome. I always love talking to you. That's I bring you on the podcast so we can hang out. Um, we we hung out at South by Southwest last year. That was fun. There's a po- yeah, there's a podcast awesome. online. Yeah, we we did a podcast on their stage. That was fun talking about the passion economy. So um, very cool. Well, as we go into a new economy, um, it'll be interesting to see where your stuff lands. And then we'll have to have you back on the show. Yeah. At some point. I love that. Okay. And, and, Very cool. Uh, yeah. This was awesome. Thank Very you. cool. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the Businessology Show. We'll check you next time on our February show. We're out. We'll see you. <laughs>